Welcome everyone and thank you for joining our webinar today on making environmental health resonate for today's students. My name is Suzanne Walker and I'm the Senior Marketing Manager for Public Health here at Jones and Bartlett Learning and I'll be your MC and co-presenter today. In this webinar, Dr. Deborah Falta will explain how she strives to make environmental health topics resonate for her students. By way of example, today she will illustrate how she uses timely case studies to explain features of environmental health risk management decisions. So let me introduce our presenter. Dr. Alma Falta is a senior lecturer at Clemson University College of Behavioral, Social, and Health Sciences. She has her master's in public health from University of California, Berkeley, and a PhD in environmental engineering and science from Clemson. Focus on environmental epidemiology and human health risk assessment, as well as children's environmental health and epigenetics. She is also author of the soon to be published third edition of Maxwell's Understanding Environmental Health, which we will touch on towards the end of this presentation. And to really kick things off, I'd like to begin with a one question poll. So I'm going to launch that poll now. So the question in the poll is Are you currently teaching or planning to teach environmental health? And um, we have 74% uh, say yes, 13% and 13% say hope to in the future. So with that, I'm gonna close the poll and then I am going to move on to the next slide and turn things over to Dr. Falta. Well, hi guys. I'm excited that 75% of you are already teaching and a bunch more are planning to teach. I love this subject. I've been teaching it since, in some capacity, since 1993, before some of you probably who are teaching it now were born, definitely before my current students were born. Anyway, but part of my job when I teach environmental health, and I tend to teach to upper undergraduates like juniors and seniors here at Clemson University. Um, part of what I want to do is have my enthusiasm for the subject rub off on them. I also like to get a sense of where they are in their understanding of the environment and our health risks from the environment. So before I ever do my first lecture on any kind of content for the course, I, ha I ask them for to participate in a poll. I try to gauge their perceptions of their environmental health risks. And so you can see here, these first couple slides are some results from a survey I've been giving the students for 25 years already now. And you can see that I started with sort of a general question about how do you feel about, you know, I feel that risk to my health come from, associated with the environment are, and you can see this is the results from my current group. And that's a pretty smart answer, a nice balance. Next slide, please. The next slide, this one I know is too busy to really see, but you can tell that what I'm going for here is I'm identifying all sorts of different arenas in environmental health and also natural versus synthetic or anthropogenic risks and trying to gauge what the students think poses their highest risk or low, no risk across the spectrum. There's another question I ask along with this where I say, which one do you think is the greatest and which one do you think is poses the least threat? And it's interesting because you know I'll have students who are exactly opposite in what they feel is the case. And that's fine because this, this isn't a survey that they you know have any grade associated with, it's anonymous, but I do share these with the students as a way to sort of introduce what we're thinking about. Year to year, it changes a little bit but not a lot with your 18 to 24 year old crowd. So again, you can kind of see the things that matter here. Maybe a little bit more concern with air pollution this time around than some years past. Next slide, please. I also try to see what specific health outcomes are worried about related to the environment. Um, you can see cancer shows up a lot on this one, but I let them choose up to three, which is why you get quite as many responses for these, but it's interesting. I'm going to gear the students to be writing a special topics report, and sometimes I find that it's easier to motivate them based on what health outcome they're worried about than actually 
an aspect of the environment, at least early on. Um, next slide. This one I thought you would enjoy seeing too. How much confidence do you have in the information provided about environmental health risks from the following sources? So you can see I mentioned healthcare providers, church and religious groups, friends, university administrators, faculty or staff, federal agents, state agents, environmental action groups, the internet, other media. Um, I'm happy every year. I'm always kind of worried about where the students will be as far as who they're listening to, what they're reading, what you know, podcasts they care about. But I'm always sort of relieved to see if they have a healthy amount of skepticism for the internet. Um, lots of faith in healthcare providers. Now, most of my students are health science majors, so they're going into that, and that might give extra credibility there. Um, you also, I, I like that there's a moderate amount of confidence in those of us here at the university. But I thought you'd enjoy that. And you can see a lot of faith in the Fed and the state environmental agencies. Um, so that's interesting because the next, next slide, please. The first part of the course, the first unit, is about how we appraise health risks from our environment. And so I was gonna talk a little bit about what these students get after they've sort of shared with me their interests, thoughts, and beliefs. I go, I step through in chapter one, I introduce environmental health definitions and concepts. It's a lot like what the second edition um, for Nancy Maxwell's book was like, but I've added a little bit more in there about environmental health risk transitions and related to economic development, if you know cousin curve, some more to do with that for why different communities experience different risks from either regional, well, household regional or environmental hazards. So that's the first chapter. The second chapter then that the students step through is very much the science of how we try to characterize and quanti quantify risks from the environment. So toxicology, epidemiology, exposure assessment, quantitative risk assessment. It's, you know, and even for my students, a lot of that's new. Some of it's familiar. I sometimes have students from environmental science or um, sometimes environmental engineering, so they can kind of draw in, but I'm trying to bring us all up to the same page of understanding the science that gives us our best scientific estimate of a risk from the environment to human health. And then chapter three is someone I'm really gonna focus on this in today's webinar. And it's new to this edition. I took the environmental risk management section out of the second edition and made it into its own chapter. And in this chapter, then we specifically address all of the components that will influence decisions and in how we manage environmental health. Um, like I said, the focus of today's webinar is really how I've incorporated some case studies into this new chapter to try and provide examples to the students of, of these various components. Next slide, please. All right, so this fancy figure here is basically, if you see at the bottom, that's chapter two. They've had all the science. And so the very best estimate science can give us about a kind of environmental health risk. And then in chapter three, we say, well, there's everything else that matters for what the ultimate environmental risk management decision may be. And so again, actions taken often by government agencies to control or reduce environmental risks, and it has to consider the magnitude of the risk, but also economic costs and benefits, legal and regulatory frameworks, technical options for controlling a hazard, and stakeholder acceptance of the remaining risk. And that acceptance of risk is really where I start this chapter. Um, next, next slide, please. You know, kind of like the survey I give the students early on, your perspective and understanding societal perspectives about risk is very important for any of us who are going to try to help study what kind of risks happen or regulate, you know, and go out there and make decisions about how to mitigate a hazard. So it's really important to understand the social societal acceptability of a risk from environmental exposures. And oftentimes that's complicated and it involves so much more than just trying to have the experts say, this is our best scientific estimate, you know? So I mentioned here risk communication, you know, it's the exchange of information about a hazard between experts and those affected, but us experts, 
and several of my friends in our local health department and stuff like that, we tend to maybe try to present the science and assume everyone will be happy now that we've shown them the science. Whereas the public perception of an environmental health risk often includes what we call here hazard plus outrage features, you know, and this next slide that I have provides you some of these features that will often generate some outrage. For example, if it's a exposure or risk outside of their control, yeah, sure, driving a car or smoking might make me sick or hurt me, but I control it. I don't like when I'm having to fly with someone else driving the plane, even though I couldn't fly the plane. But it, those sorts of things, if it's lack, I have lack of control in the switch situation. So of course, with environmental exposures, like the air we need to breathe, and if it's polluted, those are sort of, again, involuntary exposures that may tend to make something seem worse. Um, I have a couple things from the chapter that I've put on this slide. The consequences are serious, like people die, or lots of people are affected all at once, or they're irreversible, or sometimes it's just scary because we don't know. I really have thought that a lot of the information about BPA that showed up in plastics was one of those where we could see things in the Petri dish and we saw stuff early on and it was out there already, but we really didn't know what it would do to human health. So, and we've researched it further. Um, other consequences of exposure, or the consequences may be delayed, like a cancer comes around later. This fourth bullet, it's not natural, but it's really the result of anthropogenic activities or it's synthetic, it's not organic, some of those sorts of things. Um, the hazard could have been avoided. Was it even necessary to have, you know, had this risk presented? So all of these things have to tie into it. You can see my last bullet too. The outrage may be particularly acute if it's a group that's already experienced past injustices. Um, in my era, I mentioned the example with lead poisoning in children in Flint, Michigan, which could have been completely avoided if someone had taken the time to use anti-corrosive treatment when they changed the water supply. And that group it has to start feeling like maybe people didn't care and it was unfair how it happened. Um, there are a couple, you know, the placement where I live, we have a lot of the concentrated animal feeding operations and they tend to go into low income areas and, you know, with places where they know people need a job, even if it's kind of a nasty one. So again, all these things go well beyond what the best scientific effort is. Um, next slide, please. So again, related to a risk susceptibility is who's involved, the stakeholders. So any person or group with a vested interest in the decided outcome, including property owners and community residents, industries or their employees, municipal entities and political representatives, corporate and environmental lobbyists or legal or special guardian representatives of vulnerable members of a population. So, you know, simply put, that stakeholders are those who are affected by a problem at hand and who will be affected by the chosen solution. So they all really need to be heard. And if the risk that's ultimately either decided upon, like let's not do anything, it's not so bad, this amount will be okay. If that's deemed or perceived as unacceptable, then oftentimes you'd have to say the risk management process has failed and legal action is often initiated. They'll take you to court and sue. Next slide, please. So again, this is just kind of saying, you know, the legal courtroom, when we have these environmental risk management situations occur, really accentuates all of those stakeholder perception concerns, you know, as far as control or trust in the group that's manufacturing this product that's scary or different the fear of the unknown, it often diminishes even more so any kind of scientific insight. And it can be made much worse when the science is ambiguous as to the true degree of harm, which is in the case study I'm about to tell you about. Um, I just wanted to, one more bullet on, in general in the courtroom setting, the characteristics of the aggrieved party versus the defendant can often sway the decision made by the jury of the peers. And it is related to things like the vulnerability of the victims. Are we talking about small children who couldn't have helped themselves? Um, the defendant 
is this a group we haven't trusted anyway? They've been involved in strange like genetic modification or subterfuge, or they knew, but they hit, you know, how trustworthy is this group that we're, we've taken to court? And also how deep are their pockets? So the defendant's finances often have some sway in why we're trying to go after them in court. Not always. Next slide, please. So I hope you appreciate this case study that I put in. This is the one with the Roundup litigation that's going on. Again, Roundup is Monsanto's trade name for glyphosate, which is an herbicide. As you can see in my first bullet, over $289 million was recently re rewarded to a school custodian, I believe in the San Francisco area, who had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that he claimed was associated with spraying Roundup to keep down the weeds in the playground with his job. You'll see that there are currently 125,000 cancer lawsuits involving Roundup pending in the United States. So this is a big one and people are worried. Now, like I said, Monsanto introduced glyphosate back in 1974. Um, glyphosate works by obstructing a protein that plants have but that animals evidently don't for synthesizing new proteins and stuff. So again, it was considered non-toxic to humans when it occurred because we didn't have that biological pathway. Okay, that was the theory. Um, and it was produced, but what really happened is after some genetic, after Monsanto genetically modified different crops like corn and soy to withstand treatments with glyphosate, so Roundup Ready Corn, you've heard of these, I'm sure. Um, you could then plant your seeds and then you could still spray your Roundup and kill all the weeds around them while the corn products grew or whatever the crop was. Well, when that happened, the use of the herbicide and all these Monsanto project, project, um, products increased tremendously. Um, next slide, please. So again, I guess I should have had a bullet in there. I mean, it produced, you know, even though 90% of the use of these products is in major agro businesses, you still had like a, I forget exactly the statistic, but it was like a 300% increase in purchasing of the product for domestic re residential use as well. So you can see there were a lot of folks like me who would had Roundup and I'd go out there in my shorts to the weeds in the driveway crack and spray it you know, and watch the little weed die away and, you know, my driveway would look much better. So, you know, we had that and there were a lot of folks like that who then felt like they had been pre presenting with a risk who are these litigants. Well, the scientific estimates of harm that have been introduced in the court setting associated with glyphosate are also contradictory. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency asserted that glyphosate is not likely to be carcinogenic to humans whereas the International Agency for Research on Cancer, IR, classified it as a group 2A, probably carcinogenic to humans compound. So our two of our major global think research centers give us very opposite answers in this case. Now the EPA focused on health effects data when Roundup was used as directed by labeling, so more typically in a large agricultural setting, and they also tended to review more unpublished data that had these null or negative findings of any kind of risk. Whereas IARC considered all likely types of exposures, so including folks like me at home spraying it on weeds in my driveway, um, and like I said, the most common type of plaintiff, and they also reviewed only peer-reviewed published resources on the science. So that it, again, when it came to these pending lawsuits, and I should add that Monsanto was purchased by Bayer AG Ag, and so they have inherited all of the liability concerns too. And uh, just stay tuned. This is very much a contemporary issue for where all of this, these legal um, challenges for can, especially lymphomas linked to glyphosate will be. And again, the lack of transparency and disclosure during the review process harmed both the EPA, but also the IR conclusions. Um, I should say that here in the United States, we were so upset with IARC that, um, let me just find this real quickly. The chair of the U.S. Congressional Committee on Science, Space, and Technology is recommending withholding government funding for future IARC work. 
it's like you can see there's definitely lots of contentious issues and it's a lot of money involved too next slide please i was about ready to hit that so mentioning the money brings up the next kind of major component for environmental risk decision making which is these economic perspectives about risks Again, stakeholder perspectives regarding the acceptability of a risk will often include consideration of the benefits and costs associated with the risk mitigation action. Now, that's not true for all environmental risk protection actions, but definitely who pays for it, the polluter pay principle definitely is embedded in several of the ways that we go about managing environmental risk. Um, I have two different federal statutes I mentioned that are definitely based on the polluter pay principle. For example, RICRA, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, was enacted in response to growing concerns in the 60s about ever increasing amounts of waste. And then we added hazardous waste to RICRA a few years later. And so again, this one just basically is saying, embed the cost of accessing or manufacturing the chemical after use of it, the transportation and the ultimate, so from the cradle to then the ultimate dep deposition where you get rid of it, the waste, you know, embed the cost through there, use a manifest system, have, you know, clipboards of paper to keep track of the chemicals used. And basically the idea was, okay, whoever's going to have a tendency to be making a mess, manufacturing a widget should also make sure that they have to include the cost of that mess in their manufacturing bottom line. So that's kind of the goal with RICRA, the cost of any resource degradation being incorporated. Next slide, please. However, the polluter pay principle is also incorporated into abandoned hazardous waste exposures and how we try to manage those. Um, the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, CERCLA, such a mouthful for that law, um, also known as Superfund, was enacted to address cleanup for abandoned hazardous waste sites. So compared to RICRA for sort of active ones. And CERCLA was the result of several shocking discoveries made during the 60s and 70s about abandoned hazardous exposures, such as Love Canal. So next slide, please. Which is, the, and Love Canal is the second case study I kind of wanted to use and I share with my students. I usually ask if they've ever heard of it, and most of them have not, or if they have, it's from a song or something, but definitely my 20 somethings, this is an old story. So again, I start with the case study of, in 1978, President Carter, then President Carter, declared a federal health emergency for the Love Canal neighborhood of Niagara Falls, New York, and encouraged the evacuation of hundreds of residents from their recently built homes, which you can imagine the outrage there and the shock. Chemical waste disposed decades earlier had been detected in basements, causing putrid odors and chemical slimes in a myriad of colors. In some of the reports you can read from this time, people were scared. They were frightened. It was definitely an outrageous, awful, shocking kind of situation. Children had also been warned to steer clear of strangely smelling puddles in their backyards instead of, you know, a kid in her rain boots puddling through. Um, the source of the contamination was a mixture of chemical waste that were originally disposed of by the Hooker Chemical and Plastic Corporation in the remnant of Love's Canal. Next slide. So why was this canal there? Well, William Love was an unsuccessful developer in the late 1890s who had managed to dig only one mile of his envisioned six mile long canal that would have connected the upper and lower portions of the Niagara Rivers for this planned utopian community. And that was gonna be part of their source of energy. Like I said, he got one mile in and he lost his money, we'll say that, and he gave up. So then the city had this big handy one mile long ditch and they initially used it for municipal construction waste. Um, then sold the canal to the hooker company who used it for the next 20 years for chemical waste disposal. And you have to realize that during the 30s and 40s into the early 50s, this was the chemical industrial revolution. Lots of chemicals were being discovered. And as we would figure out what wonderful things we could do with them in industry, we didn't have any sense at that time really of concern about, you know, let's 
exercise a little bit of caution about if this could also be hazardous to us. You know, Carson's Silent Spring wasn't published until the 60s. So he really, you know, I, you can't even really necessarily blame the, the hooker company. They were figuring out all sorts of chemicals and plastics, and they had a handy place to dump things in. Maybe. So by 1953, more than 22,000 tons of waste filled the canal. It was full, and so it was sealed over with dirt and a clay layer, and Hooker basically sold it to the city, or at least the school district, so that they could build a new elementary school. Because by this time, after the war, the suburb, the move to the suburbs movement was kind of happening, and people wanted to get out and own single you know, family homes. And so they needed more, they had more neighborhoods, and they needed a new elementary school. So like I said here, the school district purchased this land from Hooker for the construction. At the time, the hazards that it might be built over hazardous waste weren't really a salient concern. However, Hooker did have a disclaimer for any side effects from future chemical exposures. So maybe they had some suspicions. Next slide, please. For the next 20 years, the neighborhood grew with occasional complaints about strange odors or children experiencing rashes after playing outside. Um, but again, there weren't a lot of people you would complain to at that time. But in 1976, heavy rains caused the chemical waste in the canal to overflow and truly contaminate and wash across the entire neighborhood. At that point, residents were really angry and they did demand that something be done. And by this time, the Environmental Protection Agency existed, and so residents had a regulatory avenue for voicing their concerns. You also, like I said, Silent Spring had come out, so people maybe were a little more fed up with environmental pollution and the risk it might pose to health. The political fallout associated with Love Canal led directly to the passage of CERCLA. So again, it requires the EPA to attempt, and part, the reason it's called Superfund it requires the EPA to attempt to identify private parties responsible for cleaning up discovered abandoned hazardous waste sites. So that's the polluter pay principle there. It also, though, created a mechanism to accrue federal monies for cleanup when legal liability cannot be assigned to a private party, and that's the super fund. Again, a lot of money of super, the CERCLA has gone into legal battles over I'm not responsible, you're responsible. The previous owner is responsible. No, they're not around. So again, a lot of money's been spent in the legal arena fighting having to actually start doing any cleanup. Next slide, please. Okay, CERCLA is a complicated process. I'm not going to try to take too much time to talk about CERCLA, and I don't do that in my class either, but I do try to make sure the students understand a few key things about it, such as the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Reg Registry, the ATSDR, which I refer students to when they're trying to find out about certain compounds and whether they're risky and what science we have. They were placed in charge of ranking these abandoned waste sites when they're discovered and deciding if they rank high enough to go on the national priority list. There's also state priority lists. So again, that HPL scoring and national public or national priority list citing all comes in from sort of groups of toxicologists and stuff like that, assessing what mess is there and what the mess will be if you don't do anything versus if you have to do something. So the second bullet, part of the remedial investigation when you've had a site discovered is you conduct a baseline risk assessment. And at this point, I've also told the students about risk assessment steps in the previous chapter. So but this kind of gives them a little bit more. This is where it got codified in many ways, where you try to decide what is the risk if you don't do anything from the mess that's in this particular waste site. And if that no action risk is deemed unaccept unacceptable, that's when you have the stakeholder input, you know, as well as regulatory statutes and, alter you know, to decide what remedial actions can be fully described and finally a decision documented and perhaps followed up and cleaned up and hopefully delisted eventually, although we haven't had a whole lot delisted. Next slide, please. As of June 12th, 2019, there were 1,344 Superfund sites on the national priority list in the United States. I have the students get this website or this web link live and kind of drill down into their own zip codes and look around so you can um, play with that. Maybe we can send this site 
out or this website out to you. It's not hard to find if you just kind of type in super fun sites. But we do usually spend some time for them to sort of see where the sites are. And they often will be like, well, did you have any idea? Next slide, please. So again, this last this slide here is how would you engage students even further? Related to the Superfund sites, I would ask if they know of any near their home. Here at Clemson, I often will somewhat shock our kids and I'll say, well, you know, are you, our lovely Lake Hartwell, Lake, the Clemson campus is along the shoreline of Lake Hartwell. Um, it's a Superfund site and that it's one due to PCBs. And then after they look at me and aren't sure what to think, I'll usually go into the story about that one specifically. But again, in understanding PCBs. So it is a way to kind of make things salient to your students when you can kind of point out the mess that's there and how much is known and what, what's been done. Chapter three, wrapping up this first unit, also has several other topics in there, such as environmental justice as a feature of risk management decisions. I mentioned the precautionary principle related to regulating environmental risk management approaches and how the cat was out of the bag for a lot of what we did in our country, but some of the laws in our country or elsewhere where we've tried to look before we leave. Um, I also talk about sort of some of the statutes and the technologies that can be used going forward, like the best available technology philosophy, if you will, which is kind of under the category of command and control approach to policy making. There's a very cute, um, I can't say cute, I guess, a video that I show of one of my former advisors, Dr. Bruce Yandel, that talks about bootleggers and Baptists, and it's a way to explain the command and control approach to regulatory environmental policy making. You look for who's going to benefit the most. So for example, with the bootleggers and Baptists, they'd both be happy with not being able to sell liquor on Sunday. Um, so again, there's that. Um, and at the end of the chapter, I also try and talk about going forward and how we're trying to sort of, all of our federal statutes are fairly old, guys. A lot of them have been amended, but it's probably time for a little fresh insight and sustainable thinking going into some of our um, risk management decision-making. And so an example talking about going from revising the cradle to grave approach I mentioned for RICRA, to the cradle to cradle recycling loop with life cycle assessments and things like that. So I try to bring all of that in. Um, now the students, especially from chapter two, are often a little bit overwhelmed with new material that they haven't necessarily thought of from their other health, health promotion classes or pre-med classes. So I also try to encourage some reading by having these quizzes. Now, before the pandemic, it would just be that I would sort of say, hint, hint, be sure you've caught up on my lecture content in the chapter before next class. And at the beginning of the class, I'd have kind of a low stakes little quiz. With the pandemic and COVID restrictions, I've been using Canvas and having a lot more little quizzes available that they need to take. My goal with those is to give them a whole bunch that will prepare them for the major exams, let them see what's going on, but not necessarily one, like if they really weren't prepared for it in one case, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. They now know what they need to study. Um, next slide, please. So in conclusions, by the end of this chapter in this first unit, hopefully the complexity of how environmental health risks are perceived and risk management decisions made prepare students for evaluating the material in the following chapters, as well as investigating their own special topic for a research report. And hopefully has kind of lit a fire under them to care, especially about one particular topic, if not everything that I expect them to learn in my class. But those are some of the ideas that I have when it comes to trying to resonate, make this an exciting and great topic for the students. Well, that was great. I know I learned a thing or two, and I wanted to share with you, I think we mentioned this at the beginning of the presentation, that uh, Dr. Falta is the new author on the uh, Maxwell Understanding Environmental Health, what, How We Live in This World. Um, she, while Nancy Maxwell did not contribute to this edition, her voice is very present in this book often promotes advocacy. And that was a goal of Dr. Falta was to keep that her voice 
um, promoting advocacy there. Also, she really went through and updated the book throughout with 15 new case studies addressing contemporary issues. Um, she just talked about the new chapter detailing the societal and economic factors of managing environmental risks, which is new to this edition. She's also added more and more comprehensive discussion of occupational health. And the book has gone to a full color design, which really enhances the many graphics throughout the text. Um, every book uh, it also includes Navigate eBook Access, which um, is great for being able to access online or offline. Students can also buy just an eBook version of the book, of, of the actual book, for about half the price of the printed text. So if you're interested in learning more, you can go to the URL at the bottom of the screen. Um, and with that, I'd like to move on to questions. Um, so we have a few questions that have already um, popped into the question box, which I thought I'd read and have uh, Dr. Falta respond to. So the first question is, which do you find more resonance with, contemporary case studies or oldies but goodies? Oh, that is a good question. I think it depends how well I know the story. So again, if I can take an oldie but make it seem shocking, outrageous, you know, timely and really clear, I think that works sometimes with the students, like the Love Canal. But if it's a new one, it's great for me to learn it. And it's also, I usually try to, you know, I think with the more recent ones, those are probably more immediately salient to the students. Like, this is the world that you're in and that you will be affected by. So I think those are good. I, But I think definitely, depending on the size of your class, like I tend to teach large lectures, 30 to 50 people. So it's not, I can't throw a discussion out there. with. And again, I think with a new case study, that's what I want to do is, what do you guys think? You know, have you heard of this? What's going on? I'd love to know how other teachers out there can manage it, you know. That's great. Um, so we have another question here. Do you incorporate more basic philo philosophic principles to examine health risks beyond courtroom slash local legal basis? Example, what is good and relation between in common and individual good? That sounds like someone a lot smarter than me related to sort of social justice and maybe health belief model and stuff. So I would have to say I may not incorporate as much as you probably could from the nature of your question. But most of my students are here at Clemson, they're undergrad, they're basically an undergrad public health degree that's a lot related to health promotion and behavior. So, and several of my students are um, international health um, majors as well. So they come to me typically fairly concerned about health disparities and some of those issues. So I may not have to embed it as much as just kind of tag them for, so does this seem fair? Ethically, this is an issue. Um, I, so I try, again, I, I have a feeling you have a lot to share. Whoever wrote the question would have a lot more to share for ways to embed that. I very much care that they take an active public health practitioner role so that they're not just learning facts and spitting them back, that they're going to apply these things and go out there and find the problems they want to solve. Great. Okay, we have another one here. Uh, environmental law is fascinating. Is there a graphic of NPL sites in Alaska and in Hawaii? Thanks, Dr. Conkle. Okay, I would go to that website and look around. You know, that's a screen capture of the map for the U.S. There, you would think there has to be Alaska and Hawaii. They're states. So again, I would go to that um, maybe um, Suzanne, we can send out that specific website again, sure. you know, later for folks. Because there's got to be, especially Alaska, well, and Hawaii. And again, there, if it's not on the NPL, it could be on the state listing, you know, for how to get in line with the money. But the whole thing with Superfund is such a quagmire in many ways for, like, just how we decide what's good. Like personally here, right as my husband and I moved to Clemson to teach, 
we were they had the EPA holding the stakeholder meetings on Lake Hartwell and they the concern is PCBs that were dumped in one river or in an arm of the, the lake now and then it turned out to be that the fish eat them and it really bioaccumulates into the big fish so they had proposed they could build a fish fence that boats could still get across but the fish could not swim through under this one bridge and just kind of hole everything up one arm of the lake it was like how is that going to work but again it's really it is fascinating for legally what they ended up doing or regulatory wise is fish advisories if you're going to fish in lake hartwell don't eat the fatty parts of certain fish and don't eat any of these certain fish Okay, we have another question here. Would a case study on PFAS be more relevant for students than Love Canal? I have one later in the book, in chapter six, because definitely, you know, one of the most persistent compounds yet. I have a case study on the C8 panel, which is the group that had to do all the science as part of the lawsuit related to West, you know, to West, what is it, West Parkersburg? Virginia, West Virginia, so or Parkersburg, West Virginia. So yeah, definitely in my chapter six, I, I get to that because I think those PFOAs, PFOSs, are some of the scariest ones out there. And I'll have to tell you, I learned about them from a student. Several years ago, one of my students, when I was talking about their special topic paper and how you have a rationale for which one you're gonna do, she was from West Virginia she had juvenile arthritis and had been part of studies going on due to her exposure living in that town, you know, and being exposed. So she was my first sort of introduction of maybe as much many as eight years ago to what's going on here. So no, I fully agree. That's a one of the more salient big concerns out there right now. Okay, I have another question here. I'm excited about the book. How really do you get students to read? <laughs> My quizzes help. And I try not to be too punitive because students nowadays are efficiency experts. You know, if they can get it all from a lecture, then why read? If they can get it from your PowerPoint slides without your lecture, why come? You know, I really, and I don't mean to put my students down at all. I feel it's, they are busy. I need to make class entertaining and helpful to them. And I also been, felt that way with the writing of the book, where it's like, guys, I cannot possibly tell you all the nuances in a lecture. And yet I will be testing you on this. And usually, like I said earlier, I will say things like, okay, if my whole story and all this information today was new, I suggest that you get caught up on the reading before the beginning of our next class. Hint, hint. And that's when there might be a little quiz coming at them. So that's a challenge. Think, go ahead. Oh, I think we have one final question here, and it's a question about the book itself. What will be the cost of the third edition? And that's a me question. Um, it's going to be eighty six ninety five for the printed text, and the ebook I think is forty two ninety five. It's about half the price. So um, that's the cost of the book. Uh, I don't see any more questions, so I'd like to thank Dr. Falta for today's presentation, and I want to thank all of you for taking the time out of your schedules to come and listen to the presentation. I hope you all enjoyed it. If you have any questions or comments or feedback, please email me at this address on the screen, swalker at jblearning.com, and I hope you all have a great rest of the day. Thanks again.